Yeah, I'm ready. Do you want me to hold this for you, or do you want to take it? Uh, I can take it. Then. Oh, yeah. Let's do it then. All right, sounds good. Guten Tag, it's Rich from Hughes and Kettner in Luxembourg in a bank with Josh Rand from Stone Sour. <laughs> Josh, thanks for, for joining us before your sold out show here. Oh, thank you. How's it been going so far, the tour? Uh, it's been amazing. I mean, really every show for us has been selling out. If it hasn't already in advance, then it has by the time that we get to that city. So, I mean, uh, it's been an amazing uh, fall tour for us over here. And it's been a while since we've been here, so, um, you know, the reception, um, you know, we've been gone for four years, has been uh, overwhelming in a pleasant way, you know, it's to come back and play, you know, like we were just discussing, you know, where we played the club before and now we're playing a place that seats, you know, four times as many people and it's sold out, it's, it's pretty crazy, especially this far, I think, in uh, our career, you know, it's... We've been doing it for 17 years and to now become you know this album for you know for whatever reason is it's really drawn people in you know we've always are going to have our core audience but it's like we're growing the band is consistently has gotten bigger every album we put out and um for that i'm very grateful what do you think the main reason is for kind of that growth i mean i know the fans they do wait it's mm -hmm. two or three years between each album because some of you guys have other bands that they're in, the slip not to do and stuff like that, but what's the main reason for you why it's kind of going that sort of a way? I think because we've always evolved, um, and I think that's the reason why, you know, and our fans have kind of grown with, with us growing, not only as musicians and artists, but as just people, you know, things change, especially when you've been doing it for as long as we have. Um, and I think that the, we've always have done records that um, we're 100% backed as far as the creativity side of it. You know, we've never painted ourselves in a corner, even from the first album, um, which has allowed us the freedom to be able to create whatever we want. And I think that by doing so, there's an honesty that I think that you hear in the records. And I, and I think. The main thing, though, is I just think that the our audience has grown with us. You know, we we every record is a progression of of the previous one, and we're not a band that puts out the same record over and over again. And I think for us that that works. You know, yeah. it is kind of obvious when you listen to the first records and like the newer ones. It does go off not in a prog direction as such, but there's a lot more of that influence in it. There's concepts behind the records is that what you're talking about there? well i think there's just a maturity of of over time just like if you do in any industry or, or profession the more that you do it the more comfortable that you become with it and i think with us you know the difference between this record and the first record is um we were extremely green going into the first record and it was honestly none of us knew what to expect you know and, and just that whole learning curve of you know, when you're when you're a young band and you're playing clubs, you know, you, it's just like, for instance, it's like, okay, I got a guitar and amp, and you want a specific guitar and amp, but making a proper record, I mean, there's this whole other thing that goes into it, and you know, a learning curve, whether what guitars you use and amps and effects and the process of doing it, are you going to do it individually? Are you gonna do it, you know? as a group, that's what we did on this last record is we got into one big room and just jammed the songs out, which nowadays is unheard of. You know, everybody tracks, you know, individually and it's about being perfect. And for us, um, we're not an extreme metal band, so it's like we're a rock and roll band, so it, we don't need to be perfect and precise and accurate, you know, and we just got into one big room and banged out the songs and you know and uh, I think that you hear that in this latest record you tried to record some of the stuff without digital effects and post-production and stuff if I'm right um there wasn't very much post-production to it at all um, we laid down the core basically we did a song a day and uh, you know going into it you 
I can't think of very much post-production effects that were added, at least on the guitar side. Um, you know, it's a pretty cut and dry record. I knew for myself what I wanted tone-wise and, you know, and effects-wise. So going into that, you know, that I did track those tracks. That's how they were recorded and it wasn't added post. So it, it's, it's the way we recorded it, it, it was really pretty punk rock to a degree, you know. Um, which, I mean, I'm proud of, like I said, not many bands do that anymore. It's kind of a lost art of everybody playing together as a band. <laughs> so. I mean, I remember the Foo Fighters on their last record. They did that and it was a huge thing. Oh, they're using tapes and analog gear and stuff like that. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, we still use Pro Tools, um, but, you know, the thing is, is we didn't use a click track at all. So Roy is our click track. Yeah. So there was no digital editing. You, I mean, once you remove, you have that fluctuation uh, of a person playing drums and he's pretty solid. Um, you know, that was the idea. It wasn't, because I think Pro Tools, don't get me wrong, is, I mean, I write with it and I think it's a great tool and, and it's awesome. I just think sometimes it can be over abused by everybody wanting everything to be so precise and perfect. Yeah. And, uh, we just wanted stuff to breathe and not be locked into a grid. You know, that was the goal. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your guitar sound on the record then. We, we know, of course, that you're using the Triumph from mm -hmm. us in, com in uh, collaboration with your Ibanez guitars, which you've used for years. Tell us about what you went for this time out. Um, for me, my tone really didn't change that much at all. Um, the Really, the only difference was I mean, we do use three different tunings in Stone Sour, primarily. Um, was finding, for me, the right guitar um, that fit the song. And I know a lot of people, um, that might sound crazy, but certain guitars, I think, um, depending on what it is, and it could be because I also have, you know, we talked about the Ibanez guitars, and they're all, they're all loaded with different pickups. Some of them have DiMarzio, some of them have EMG, some of them have Fishman. Um, but it really depend on what song we were tracking and that kind of really, I think the amp itself really never changed. It was just more of what guitar I was using. Um, as far as the effects side, um, for the most part, I use the Strymon stuff and uh, even Tide. Is that, is that a newish thing for you? Because I don't recollect seeing that rig before. Well, this time around, it is a newer rig. Um, as far as the pedal board, I really wanted to, uh, on this break that I had while Corey did Slipknot, I really wanted to try different stuff and figure out really what is the best chorus, what is the best reverb, delay, what works for me. Um, what I found out is really, you know, the Strymon stuff and the H9 pretty much covers everything for me um you know we have i have the jack white fuzz and stuff and i just tried out a bunch of stuff and then i decided well this is the best stuff that i could uh you know put together you know and i wanted to i really wanted to step up especially the the affected side you know my distorted side is very i mean it's me into the triumph there's there's nothing else it's my hands the ivanez guitars and the triumph and uh, that's it. And but on the clean side of stuff, I really thought that I could, you know, make stuff warmer. And plus, you know, when you once again we get back to what's different between playing live and and making, you know, a record. You know, you're not just going to use just a straight up clean sound 99% of the time when you're making a record. So I tried to recreate some of some of those uh, choruses and delays that I have used or was put on the recording itself uh, over the years and I just really wanted to step that side of things up this time. What's the biggest challenge when converting the studio sound to a live environment? Um, for me there really hasn't been. I mean because I, I mean the great thing is is when we went through all the gear when you make a record um, usually you go through all this gear and 
what you use in the studio could be very different than what you use live. And it, for me, it wasn't. So there's really no change at all. It's not like I used a different amp and a different guitar um, than what I use live. So I, for me, it was not, it's, there's no difference <laughs> between the two. That's a cool thing. You've got three maximum guitarists in the band sometimes. Is that ever an issue live, kind of finding your space within the mix? Um, no, because a lot of times we're all three playing different stuff. Um, I think if we were like a full on, you know, metal band and all three of us were playing the exact same thing, it would probably be overkill. But we're all playing different stuff, you know. You know, for instance, I'll take Through Glass, in which, you know, Christian plays the lead line over it. Corey's playing open chords and then I'm playing power chords. And Corey's sound is more of an overdriven sound where I'm more, I don't want to say metal, but I have a lot more gain going on. And if I'm playing power chords and then, you know, it's never, I think at one point or any, or all three of us playing the same thing yeah. in any of the songs. So because of that, it, it works, you know. Have you ever written stuff with that in mind or has it ever been a problem that's changed how a song turned out? Or has that never been just a problem you guys just kind of naturally fall into position? Yeah, it's always naturally kind of fell um, like that. I'm trying to think. Um, and sometimes, it, you know, you come up with crazy parts. You know, like for me, I was the last one to write my part for Rose Red. And I, I didn't want to double Corey. Um, so then that's when I wrote the clean guitar for the verses, you know. I don't think it's ever a problem. I mean, you know, as I said, for the most part, if I am playing chords, um, Corey writes, you know, a lot of stuff with open chords, so then I'll just do the power chords of it and, and add more, I guess, bite and bottom into yeah. to his strumming. Yeah. What's your typical writing process? Um, it's... It varies, honestly. For me, over the years, it's working on um, either a drum machine or now I have Easy Drummer, getting down the initial idea. I write very rhythmically. Um, you know, it, it's well documented that I always write usually the heavier side of, of Stone Sour. Um, so, you know, I just, I initially put an idea together and I kind of lay out the skeleton for an entire song. And then at that point, when I'm happy with it, then I'll give it to Corey to see if there's going to be any arrangement changes or uh, riff changes by any chance. Um, and then once he's kind of said, okay, and has written just the main lyrics or whatever, a, a, a skeleton of, of, the, of the lyrics, then that's when I'll introduce it to everybody else, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Yeah. Um, but like I said, we all write individually, and in, in the way that it's brought in, it's different depending on which member it is, you know. But then there's been times where like Ru Forty Six off of House of Golden Bones was written when I stayed at Roy's and we just jammed around one day. Yeah. So um, it, it it varies. It's a creative thing, just whatever comes out mm -hmm. at that moment. So what would a, a Josh Rand solo record sound like if you were to have someone out in 2018? Oh, it'd sound like uh, the heavier side of Stone Sour. <laughs> <laughs> it would. Um, that's, you know, what it would sound like. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I think on this next record, and I've already messed around with a couple ideas, um, that'll be, I'll introduce a couple more heavier songs with the drop tuning again. Like this record, we really didn't have any of those songs. It's all um, pretty much E flat and C sharp, but there might be some influence from the first record on the stuff that I write. But now just being like taking that influence or whatever in that style, but adding the maturity that I have over the years to it. So. Um, but we'll see what happens. Talking to your your techs earlier, we know that there's a hundred or so shows to come up on this tour. You're up till the middle of next year, but what beyond that? What's in the future for Josh Random Stone Sour? Um, well, eventually, obviously, we'll we'll have the break, and Corey will, will return to Slipknot. And I think, in, when that happens, um, 
you know, we'll loosely write for the next record um, over the over those two years or whatever it ends up being. But uh, we, there's been talk of us continuing the Burbank cover series, so maybe t you know one or two of those will also come out in that time period. And uh, you know, the great thing is is about having those breaks is it's a chance to recharge and uh, and get excited about recording. I, I, I honestly, over the years, everybody always asks me, what do you think about the breaks, you know, honestly? And, it, and to be quite honest, I actually, at this point, completely embrace it. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we have the longevity that we've had. I think when, and luckily we have the success to be at the level we are, but I think when a band gets just thrown in and it's just tour, record, right back out, and it's just that process over and over and over and over again, that's what makes bands break up and all this and that and causes problems. I think us having those breaks and being able to come back to it, it's like being a new band all over again every time that you do it, yeah. except for we, you know, obviously are slowly getting bigger, which is crazy and a good thing. It's like coming back fresh every time. So yeah, cool. I mean, you know, everybody's had a break from one another and, you know, not only from the band side, but just, I mean, you have to realize you're put on a bus and you, it's like family. And just like family, at times you get sick of one another. So, I mean, that's just the honest to God's truth. So to have that, you know, two years off and then just get together here and there to work on the covers or a new record, um, I think it's huge. I mean, it, and then, like I said, then when we come back in, that's why we recorded, I think, Hydrograd so quick. You know, it only took us like six weeks to record 19 original songs, four acoustic versions, and we shot several videos in that time period. And then the last two weeks, we didn't even do six days a week. We just did five and just kind of hung out like every night listening. It was like, hey, we got the studio. I mean, the last couple weeks that we were in the studio, it was like, you know, we, we had the studio, so we were just trying to fill up time. And then we would end the day, like, listening to all these, like, classic records. We just wanted to hear them on the big speakers, you know. It's like, all right, man, let's put this up and rock out, you know. But uh, I think that's just because we really enjoyed it. It wasn't a burden to go into the studio and record. It was exciting and it was fun. Um, you went through it quite fast. but. Did the songs come into the studio fully formed, or did you come up with any spontaneous stuff that made um, it onto the record? Really, the only song, I mean, they were probably 90, I wouldn't say 90, I would say about 85% there that we had worked on um, prior to actually going in. Really, the song that took the most form in the studio was When the Fever Broke, the last track. Um, I knew that it needed. I wanted this soundscape, that's the only way I could uh, describe how I heard the song, was I just wanted it to really breathe and be, very, you know, I don't know how else to explain it, I just something different, you know, than what I traditionally write, and actually that's my favorite song on the record, because it's so different than what I've ever written for the band. Yeah. Is that a flavor of what we might expect next time around, or? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was fun to like get away from what I normally do, um, but now I'm kind of itching to get back to what I do do normally. So um, I, I I don't know, but we'll see. I, it's hard to say. Yeah. You did a little documentary for us during the recording of that in the studio where you talked a bit about the triumph and a bit about your kind of background and how you got into this. And I think it's fair to say that you're not a typical rock star in a certain sense. You came from it from a different angle and you already had, I think it was a family by the time the first mm -hmm. record came out. How has that affected your life as the career has progressed? Um, I don't know. It probably kept me grounded, you know, honestly. And, you know, because I've always, you know, already having kids and stuff, it's, uh, you know, they're, they're my priority. So I think because of that, maybe it's made it so, you know, um, it's like for me, it's family, then the band. And be because of that, maybe 
in the big scheme of things, and it's all hypothetical. I mean, but you know, instead of going out and partying and doing all of the supposed rock star stuff, I really have kind of just, you know, stayed in my own little world and not dabbed in all that crap and got caught up in it because of that. So I think that would be the main main thing you know I think it, maybe it would have been different maybe I would have been partying every day and this and that had I not had a family and kids it's as I said it's really hard to say but maybe it's a factor in the longevity maybe that like you said yeah. kept you grounded kept you going kept you motivated yeah definitely you know you imagine Stone Sour going on for another 10 20 years uh, well I mean with uh, right now, yes. I mean, I don't see why it couldn't. It's grown tremendously over the last four years with us not really even doing anything. I mean, so um, I think we can go as long as we really want to, or, you know, or, or until, you know, it, it runs its course. But right now, I don't see an end to it, you know. Awesome. Well, that's great for us to hear. We're very much looking forward to the show tonight. I shall let you go off and get ready for the stage. Josh Rand, everybody, stonesour.com. Check them out. Check us out on HewsonKetner.com. And we shall see you later. Cheers. Wow.